Kimberly McNair, Provost, the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Wagner College. And I bring you greetings on behalf of President Garofi, who unfortunately is out of town today and can't be here to welcome you all to our first lecture of the Hugh Carey Institute this semester. It's great to see all of you here. I'm so thrilled to see so many students in the audience. It's thrilled to see my faculty colleagues who are here. I'd like to introduce our trustee, our trustees. One Ms. Good, we have such a remarkable oh, right. two trustees. Two trustees. Two trustees, Dr. Aletta Kip Diamond, a proud Wagner alumna, and Senator Seymour Lachman, founding dean of the Hugh Carey Institute, and now a trustee. It's wonderful to have you back with us. And I would like to introduce the director of the Hugh Carey Institute, our own. Mr. Stephen Greenwald, an attorney by training who has done tremendous work in this area, who gives great depth and complexity to our understanding of the issues that are confronting people in the, in the prison and system, and who has also been Director of Film and Media Studies at Wagner College and is credited <coughs> with helping us to build what is now such a popular and growing Film and Media Studies program. So uh, let's all give Stephen Greenwald a welcome. Thank you, Lily. Uh, welcome to, as Lily said, the first uh, lecture of the year, our fall lecture um, for the Cary Institute. I do want to recognize and honor my predecessor <laughs> uh, and Seymour Lachman, Senator Seymour Lachman, uh, who was the founding uh, director of the Hugh Carey Institute, named after a great New York State governor, Hugh Carey, uh, really a model that many of us should and can follow, especially people working in government. Um, so we're very pleased and, and honored tonight to have uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries with us, uh, and also uh, his director of constituent services, Frida Minos. Frida. Frida is a 1999 graduate of, uh, of Wagner College, so give her a hand. <laughs> Look, we know that one of the central issues that the country is grappling with today, and that is part of the center of the discussions in the presidential campaign, is the question of criminal justice. Uh, this is a central issue. Uh, and our speaker this evening, Congressman Jeffries, brings a unique set of qualifications here with us, to us, to speak to this issue, and we've asked him to speak to the issue of criminal justice reform. Uh, he's an attorney, graduate of New York University Law School, as was I, so we fell for him. He was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, correct? Uh, and uh, practiced law at a very prestigious law firm as well. And then he got involved in public service, uh, first in the New York State Assembly for two terms. Three, three terms. Three yeah. terms, yeah. sorry, three terms. Uh, and then went on to run for and win a seat in the United States uh, Congress as a representative from the 8th District of New York, which encompasses much of Brooklyn and some of Queens. That's right. And Congressman Jeffrey's emphasis, both in the State Assembly and in Congress, has been on, it's been on a number of things, but particularly on issues around criminal justice. Uh, so just as an example that will resonate, I think, with this group, Representative Jeffries introduced the Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act of 2015. And that was his impetus stimulus for that act, that bill was because of the incident involving Eric Garner and the death of Eric Garner. Uh, so he introduced federal legislation to make sure that what happened to Eric Garner would <coughs> happen again, would happen to people again. Uh, in response to the tragic death of P.J. Avito, a six-year-old boy who was stabbed nine times in an apartment building elevator in Brooklyn, uh, Representative Jeffries introduced PJ's Act, which was designed to increase access to federal funding 
for enhanced safety and security in public housing. Um, in the State Assembly, uh, Congressman Jeffries authored laws that included protecting the civil liberties of New Yorkers, particularly aimed at, I think, stop and frisk laws, which you've heard a lot about, I think, in the presidential, if you've been following the presidential election and presidential debates, the issue of stop and frisk, which of course was used extensively here in New York in the prior administrations, was found unconstitutional, despite what one of the candidates said, uh, by a federal judge here in New York. So you see that in his career, Congressman Jeffries has been a practicing lawyer, a government lawyer, now a congressman, a former assemblyman, and in all those roles he has been involved with and worked on issues around criminal justice. And it couldn't be timelier for us to hear some of his thoughts and ideas about where we should go from here. So we welcome you, Congressman Jeffries. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to uh, be here. Let me first just thank Director Greenwald for extending the invitation for his leadership of the Hugh Carey Institute and and for those generous words of introduction, of course, to uh, the provost, Dr. McNair. Really appreciate uh, all of your leadership, the distinguished trustees who are here, and of course, Senator Lachman, uh, founding dean of, of this great institute, and uh, someone who was a tremendous member of the New York State uh, Legislature and uh, has added a lot uh, on behalf of the people of New York in terms of transparent government ethics in government, integrity in government, someone that uh, I and many uh, younger members of the New York State Legislature uh, looked up to as we were on our way into office and continue uh, to look to him uh, for his thoughts and his ideas as it relates to good government. It's great uh, to be here, of course, was mentioned uh, that Frida Manos is a, is a graduate uh, herself of this institution, my director of constituent services. I was walking uh, through the campus and she was having flashbacks and <laughs> told her, don't tell me too much uh, about what may have gone on, but she certainly enjoyed uh, herself here at Wagner College and, and, and remains uh, closely affiliated with this, this wonderful institution. I uh, will take a few moments just to talk through the uh, theme uh, around our criminal justice system and mass incarceration. Uh, and then, of course, I look forward to your questions and uh, issues and thoughts uh, and an exchange of ideas I appreciate. In particular, so many students taking the time out on a, on a very beautiful uh, fall evening to come by. It's a testament to you uh, and your pursuit of uh, a meaningful higher education in terms of your journey here through Wagner College. It's a great institution. The institute I mentioned, of course, is named after a former uh, governor who himself, uh, prior to ascending to that position, was a congressman from Brooklyn. And so we're very proud uh, of Hugh Carey. Not suggesting that I may be on a similar trajectory, but uh, we're certainly are very proud uh, of Hugh Carey and his Brooklyn roots uh, as a member of the United States Congress. I, in fact, uh, represent a district now that was once represented by Shirley Chisholm, uh, who, uh, of course, was the first African-American woman ever elected to the United States uh, Congress and, and really the first woman uh, to run for a major party nomination uh, way back in 1972, in some ways a precursor, uh, both for the ascendance of Barack Obama in 2008 uh, and now the potential ascendance uh, of Hillary Clinton uh, as the first female president of the United States of America uh, in 2016. Shirley Chisholm, uh, we believe, uh, will play some small role uh, in making it clear what is potentially possible uh, for people, and I'm proud to, to represent in large part uh, a district that she once served in the United States Congress. The district that, that I represent now uh, is one of the most diverse in the country. 33 percent 
of the people that I serve were born outside of the United States of America. Uh, we know that people from all over the world often come to Brooklyn and to Queens to pursue the American dream and that in fact is represented in the district that I serve. And so I represent African Americans, Caribbean Americans, Latinos, South Asians, the Orthodox Jewish community, uh, Italian Americans, Turkish Americans, Bangladeshi Americans, uh, more Russian speaking Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union than any other member of Congress in the country. I mean, Hakeem Jeffries, who knew? <laughs> what a great country we, we live in. And the diversity of the district in many ways is a microcosm uh, for what we have increasingly seen is the diversity of our great country. I was sworn in on January 3rd of 2013. A few weeks after that, of course, Barack Obama was then sworn in as uh, our 44th president uh, for the second time. And as a new member of Congress at that moment, myself and all the other members who were entering Congress had an opportunity to be on the Capitol steps and to attend the inauguration. Uh, and we were you know, given seats in the Capitol, but of course, because everything is done by seniority uh, in the United States Congress, we were seated way up top on the steps. But I quickly realized that there was an advantage to sitting up top because you could see everything that was happening in front of you. And I'll never forget, you know, there was the splendor of uh, the American people, the president, of course, and the first family, more than a million folks of different races, regions, and religions who had come to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., to participate in this great democratic moment. But I'll never forget that in close proximity to Barack Obama, the president of the United States of America, you had, may he rest in peace, arch conservative Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. And, and right next to Scalia, you had the former Republican House Speaker, John Boehner. And then right next to Boehner, you had the current Republican House Speaker. Then he was uh, a recent vice presidential nominee on the Republican side, Paul Ryan. And, and right next to those three, Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, only in America. Increasingly, we are a diverse country. But what I found, of course, is that though that diversity is a great strength, it also is a tremendous challenge. A tremendous challenge in Congress in terms of people representing different perspectives from all uh, over the country, ideologically and beyond. And part of what I think makes American democracy work at the end of the day has got to be the constant effort to try to find common ground. And we're in the midst of some issues right now in the criminal justice space where there's been difficulty for us as a nation to find common ground, but we've got to do everything possible if we're going to live up to the ideal of liberty and justice for all uh, in order to approach these issues around criminal justice reform. Uh, with a level of seriousness that can get us over the finish line. There have been a lot of things that have taken place in, in recent years, and of course right here in Staten Island you had the tragic death of Eric Garner, uh, which was seen all across the world, in my view, killed without uh, justification uh, through the use of a chokehold that had been prohibited by the NYPD for um, at least 20 years says at least 11 times I can't breathe on 11 different occasions, no response uh, from people who were there to protect and serve. And then, of course, a failure uh, to indict Officer Pantaleo, who was responsible for his death. And then, of course, thereafter, we uh, saw a death in Ferguson and a death out uh, in Cleveland with Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old uh, boy who was shot down in cold blood, caught uh, on video, the death of Freddie Gray out in Baltimore, Walter Scott, who was shot without justification in the back down in North Charleston, 
And then, of course, most recently, uh, Alton Sterling and his death down in Baton Rouge and Philando Castile in Minnesota. And it was at that point, and then, of course, the tragedies uh, of the officers in Dallas having been shot down. It was at that point that Cedric Richmond, who's an African-American congressman from Louisiana, who represents both New Orleans and the Baton Rouge area, and myself, decided to approach Speaker Ryan and said that we as members of Congress need to do something about this issue. And we need to approach it in a bipartisan fashion, Democrats and Republicans, progressives and conservatives, hopefully to show America that their elected representatives in the House, and the House is the institution designed by the Constitution to be closest to the people in terms of the federal government, that we are trying to tackle this problem and deal with it in a serious fashion. And deal with it in a fashion where we engage with people uh, who might not otherwise be in conversation with one another uh, about these issues. Everyone from the Fraternal Order of Police on the law enforcement side to Black Lives Matter activists uh, on the community side and folks everywhere in between. And so the speaker agreed and he decided to convene a bipartisan task force on police community relations, six Democrats, six Republicans, uh, evenly split, people from all across the country, all of us determined to try to find some solutions uh, to the emerging crisis between the police and the community and the vicious cycle of instances uh, of the excessive use of force in the view of many of us that then leads to a reaction and in some cases tragedy uh, and the death of police officers. I myself experienced this in a personal way. Uh, the two officers, Lou and Ramos, who were killed uh, in New York City, that death, that assassination, occurred in Bedford-Stuyvesant in one of the neighborhoods that I represent. And so this is a serious problem that we've got to tackle. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in my remarks on it because I wanna pivot for a moment in a manner consistent with what I have suggested to the Speaker of the House of Representatives that we needed to do as part of the overall problem. Because the issue of the police use of excessive force is important and has to be addressed. But if we want to tackle the overall dynamic, one of the areas where people on the left and the right can agree is that we have a broken criminal justice system that has resulted in the overcriminalization of America, burden most often falling on communities of color, but everybody impacted, and an over-incarceration phenomenon that has often created a situation where police officers have been put at the front line of an unjust system. And we can't assume that if we can deal with the police problem, of excessive force and make sure that officers who cross the line are held accountable, that we put into place more community sensitive policing, that we have body cameras to accurately capture for both sides of the equation these encounters that sometimes go wrong. That that in and of itself is going to take care of the problem because that uh, is, is, is an outgrowth of a broader system that has led to the criminalization of far too many people in America. Whether that's through stop and frisk policies subsequently declared unconstitutional here in New York City, broken windows policing, which targets uh, individuals for so-called quality of life offenses that are best left uh, to people other than the police in my view, that's what resulted in the Eric Garner encounter. And many of my colleagues, Republican colleagues, white colleagues, people from all across the country, and, and quite honestly say, you know, we don't get that, that the Ferguson thing. You know, we think this Michael Brown guy may have been a bad guy. And 
you know, the officer may have been justified. The Ferguson thing, nobody could really fully come together on in, in, in Congress. But they said this Garner thing, we don't understand. And part of the reason we don't understand is because what were six, seven, eight, nine New York City police officers doing enforcing the sale of loose cigarettes seems to many people on the left, on the right, Democrats, Republicans, that the notion of using New York City police resources to deal with the sale of loose cigarettes, which in the worst case is an administrative tax issue enforced, it seems, perhaps better by an administrative agency that then results in a death sentence on a street in the city of New York. But that's broken windows policing. And so it seems that unless you address these broader issues, these systematic issues that have resulted in the over-criminalization of America, that you can't really deal with the police problem. And perhaps just as importantly, many of my colleagues, Republican colleagues, have recognized through their own philosophical approach that over-criminalization is bad for America. Bad economically, bad from a libertarian standpoint, bad from the context of Christian conservatives who think that we shouldn't give somebody a scarlet letter that prevents them from being able to pursue the American dream for the rest of their life as a result of a criminal stamp having been placed on them. So it seems like there's real opportunity to tackle some of the problems that we think are very important for America to address in a responsible bipartisan fashion by dealing with the broken criminal justice system and the mass incarceration phenomenon in America. And so I just want to spend a moment or two on that and then look forward to uh, your questions, thoughts, and concerns. Uh, as you probably know, America uh, right now has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated individuals. So that means that we here in America incarcerate more people in the United States than any other country in the world. And if you were to aggregate Russia and China's prison population, it doesn't come close to approximating the number of people who we send to prison here in America, despite the fact that we've got a little over 300 million people in this country and Russia and China combined is over a billion. And so we've increasingly become a country that over incarcerates uh, and under educates and that's, that's unfortunate. And the over incarceration phenomenon really began in America in 1971 when President Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs. And he declared drug abuse in America public enemy number one. It was at the beginning or in the midst of a heroin uh, epidemic at the time, not unlike uh, some of what we are experiencing right now in America. But the approach back then was very different. So he declares drug abuse public enemy number one. At the time in America, there were less than 350,000 people incarcerated in this country. Today, there are more than 2.1 million. And the mass incarceration explosion in this country has not made us any safer. And one of the reasons why it hasn't made us any safer is because the overwhelming majority of people, certainly at the federal level, and a majority at the state level, are nonviolent drug offenders. They are not incarcerated because of engaging in a violent offense. In fact, at the federal level, where there are about 200,000 people incarcerated, the majority of the people incarcerated in this country are in state penitentiaries, but by way of example, 
at the federal level, only 11% of the people who are currently incarcerated are there for committing a violent crime. 11%. Now most people think about the federal system as a place where organized gangsters, drug kingpins, terrorists, interstate kidnappers, and almost any other high-level criminal should be. And in fact, there are some of those individuals who are in the federal penitentiary, but only 11% of the people currently incarcerated in our system at the highest level supposedly reserved for the most dangerous and deadly criminals in America actually committed a violent crime. So how do we find ourselves you know, in this situation? Well, a lot, of course, relates to the failed war <coughs> on drugs and the decision that was made to incarcerate people who otherwise would have benefited from drug treatment. And Senator Lackman uh, has had some experience in this area. I had some experience in this area, having served in the New York State Legislature, because if you just look at the example here in New York as to what happened with the explosion of our prison population, in the 1970s and 1980s, the upstate economy collapsed as a result of the automobile factories and the steel mills, the manufacturing plants packed up and left. Some went to the Sun Belt states, others left the country. And a decision was made by both Democrats and Republicans to help revive the upstate economy in New York by building prisons in their prisons. The problem is once you build a prison, You've got to fill the prison. Uh, many of you who are in the room are too young to remember, but in 1989 there was a, a popular movie, one of the most acclaimed movies of the year. It's called Field of Dreams. It uh, was starring uh, someone named Kevin Costner. He was hot at the time, not so much anymore. <laughs> but you know, Kevin Costner was one of the hottest actors at the time, and he played this, this farmer uh, who was compelled to build a baseball diamond in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa. And at first he was a little bit reluctant because there were no baseball players anywhere to be found in Iowa. But he was moved to ultimately build this baseball diamond because of a powerful voice uh, that he kept hearing which said, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. He was talking about a baseball diamond, but our experience in New York and throughout much of America is that if you build the prisons, you have to fill the prisons. And so the question is, if you can't fill those prisons with just violent felons, you gotta figure out a way to justify the prisons that you built and to continue the employment of the correction officers who are working in those prisons who otherwise would be in towns where nothing exists. Because remember, the factories and the plants and the steel mills all left. And so the vehicle, unfortunately, in New York was the draconian Rockefeller drug laws, which sent thousands and thousands of individuals, nonviolent folks, uh, drug offenders to prisons for mandatory sentences of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, sometimes uh, 25 years. Individuals who may have been doing something wrong or in other instances may have simply been at the wrong place or at the wrong time. But everybody agrees that the magnitude of the sentences were draconian, unconscionable, outrageous, and unnecessary. And thousands of people in neighborhoods that I currently represent, in Bedford-Stuyvesant or East New York, Brownsville, the West End of Coney Island, Harlem, Washington Heights, Southeast Queens, large parts of the Bronx and the North Shore 
of Staten Island, in many instances, uh, were sent away to these upstate prisons for long periods of time as a result of the draconian Rockefeller drug laws. And even when it became clear to many of us, certainly those of us from the city, that these sentences were unjust, unnecessary, and unconscionable, it was very difficult to get them reformed in Albany because there were other representatives from these upstate communities who said, if you take away these prisons, we've got nothing. Now let me make clear, Democrats and Republicans made this mistake and concluded that the way to revive the upstate economy uh, was to build these prisons. Initially in the context of the heroin epidemic and then later the crack cocaine explosion. Certainly there were problems associated in these areas that needed to be addressed from a, a criminal standpoint, but it's obvious uh, that we went overboard. And at the federal level, we know that there were some mistakes that were also made that have gotten us to a point uh, where we incarcerate more people in America than any other place uh, in the world. In 1994, there was a crime bill that has become uh, part of the dialogue, at least uh, during the primary between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, there was a lot of discussion about the adverse impact of the 1994 crime bill, which was designed to do a lot of good things uh, in the area of gun safety and social investment in inner cities and in rural America to try to alleviate uh, some of the poverty and some of the challenges that lead to criminal behavior in some communities. Uh, but it also put into place a system of uh, incentivizing punitive sentences largely around drug activity uh, that have helped to explode our prison population. And so to put that in context, when I mentioned that the war on drugs was effectively began in 1971, we've got less than 350,000 people incarcerated in America. It turns out that in 1994, that was pretty much the apex uh, of a lot of the criminal activity in this country. Public policymakers didn't necessarily know it at the time, uh, but we've seen a dramatic decline in crime in New York City and in most other parts of the country since that moment. Yet, at that particular point in time, there were less than 900,000 people incarcerated in America. And a little over 20 years later, we're up beyond 2.1. How could that be possible? Well, when you look at the 1994 crime bill, it contained about $10 billion in funding for prison construction. And that $10 billion in funding was available to the states only if the states decided to adopt mandatory minimum sentences connected to drug activity, things like truth in sentencing and or, in some instances, three strikes and you're out for offenders. And so the federal government basically said to the states, we'll give you this money to construct all of the prisons that you want, to incarcerate all of the people that you want, but you've got to, in exchange, adopt uh, these very harsh sentences at the state level, which it turns out only continue to accelerate the overcriminalization in America, with devastating consequences for a whole lot of folks, uh, and certainly disproportionately borne by many uh, in the African American community. I'm struck by the fact, and many of you may have heard this statistic before, that uh, there are more people under criminal control right now, African American men meaning incarceration, parole, or probation, than were enslaved in 1850 in America. If you think about that dynamic and the road that we've traveled and how we fought through some very tough issues in the United States of America, uh, but to get to a point where we've gone from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, 
with more people incarcerated in 2016 in the African American community than were enslaved in 1850, obviously we still have a long way to go. The good news in my view, and I'll end with this thought, is that there is growing bipartisan consensus on the need to deal with this broken criminal justice system. And when I got to Congress, I was a little bit surprised because I expected uh, that this would be the democratic position, that this would be the progressive position, uh, but we were in a Republican controlled House at the time and subsequently a Republican controlled House and Senate. And that this wouldn't necessarily be the type of issue that many of my friends on the other side of the aisle, Republicans and conservatives, would be prepared to embrace. Uh, but what I found is that some of our closest allies now in the effort to reform our criminal justice system uh, are people on the other side of the aisle. And at first I was trying to figure out, a, you know, is this some type of bait and switch situation that I don't fully uh, comprehend at the moment and some trap that I'm being lured down. You know, I'm from, I'm from Crown Heights and Bedford Stuyvesant, so I think I got a little hustle in me, but I was still a little unsure. But it turns out that if you actually were to ideologically engage in some exploration as to why it is the case that some of my friends on the other side of the aisle have become some of the most significant voices on criminal justice reform. It makes some sense. So you've got fiscal conservatives uh, who believe that America has gotten off track as it relates to the deficit and the debt and the amount of spending that we do. We spend about $80 billion a year in this country to incarcerate people, many of whom for the reasons that I laid out shouldn't be incarcerated, who've come to the conclusion that this, from a fiscal conservative perspective, is a failed government program and has resulted in a loss of human capital and economic activity uh, that would otherwise be invested in helping to lift up the American economy in a more meaningful way. And so you have fiscal conservatives throughout the states and many in the United States Congress who think we got to deal with mass incarceration from their perspective. And then you have so-called Christian conservatives, people on the religious right, who have also been very invested increasingly in dealing with criminal justice reform because theologically they believe in the concept of redemption and a second chance, right? That's the premise of Christianity, is a second chance that all of us were given from a Christian perspective when Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so from a theological perspective, you've got Christian conservatives, folks on the religious right who have said, you know what? We shouldn't have a situation of overcriminalization in America where people get stamped with a felony conviction or a criminal conviction or a misdemeanor, have paid their debt to society, and then are unable to get a job, to provide for their family, to go to school, to find housing, to temporarily receive unemployment benefits or things of that nature. And so you've got religious conservatives who are in the Congress and beyond who have said, you know what, uh, we need to strengthen our reentry and rehabilitation programs. Uh, we need to make sure that people are sentenced in a just fashion if you've done something wrong, but once you've paid your debt to society, you should be able to successfully reenter. And so you've got fiscal conservatives who are on board, you've got religious conservatives who are on board, and lastly, you have so-called Tea Party libertarians. And we know that libertarians generally believe that uh, the biggest thing that we should fear in the United States of America is government overreach. And what we've been able to argue to some of our libertarian friends is that you may have a problem with over taxation. You may have a problem with over regulation. And Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and uh, progressives can argue about taxation issues and regulation issues. And we come out often in different places but 
If you've got a problem with government overreach in the taxation space and in the regulation space, then you should also have a problem with government overreach uh, in the area of criminal justice reform because there's no area where the government can do more damage than when they are able to take away your life or your liberty as a result of overcriminalization. And so as a result, we're in a situation where I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that we can get something done because there's a coalition that's available to deal with mass incarceration of what I often refer to as the unusual suspects. <laughs> people on the left and people on the right. We started uh, a bipartisan caucus on criminal justice reform uh, about a year and a half ago. Four of us, uh, two Democrats, two Republicans, Raul Labrador, who's a Tea Party libertarian from Idaho, <coughs> Jason Chaffetz, who's a conservative Republican and Mormon from Utah, Cedric Richmond, uh, who I mentioned earlier, African American, hip hop generation Democrat from New Orleans, and then myself. And so we've got Idaho, Salt Lake City, the Big Easy, and the People's Republic of Brooklyn all represented <laughs> together. I'm confident uh, that we can find a way forward to get something done and to deal with the problem of mass incarceration in America. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some thoughts on this issue. away from mandatory minimum sentencing, how, how can we be sure that that's not going to be reproduced? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very important point. And Vice President Joe Biden talks a lot about this now. He was in the Senate. You, ha you had two different periods where mandatory minimums were put into place at the federal level. One was in 1986, and it was following the death of a of a ball player named Len Bias who died of a cocaine overdose. He was drafted by the Boston Celtics, was expected to be one of the next great uh, things, maybe not Michael Jordan, but certainly uh, in the realm of Kobe Bryant or someone of that uh, level. And he died after he had been drafted of a drug overdose. And it was one of the things, along with a few other high profile incidents, that then encouraged Congress to act and, and, and part of uh, them acting. And it was a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House at the time. And there was Republican support and there was Democratic support for the notion of the war on drugs intensifying and part of it mandatory minimums. And part of the reason for mandatory minimums because of the view that uh, judges would otherwise be able to um, discriminate in their sentencing with harsher sentencing being given to black or Latino defendants. I think overall, uh, what we have to do, the problem with mandatory minimums is that when it was combined with the tough on crime approach, uh, every time you would pass new legislation, you would increase that floor from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20, depending on the weight and the circumstances. And next thing you know, we got an overcriminalization problem in America. And so part of the dynamic is we, gotta, we, have, to, we have to allow judges to have more discretion but within the context of that discretion, reduce the overall sentencing level and place more emphasis on treatment, which is, by the way, one of the things that we're beginning to do in this country now uh, around the Oxycontin and the heroin and related uh, drug epidemic and prosecute the war on drugs less as a war 
and more as a, as a health care epidemic uh, in a manner that is sensitive to the issues. And that's going to have to be part of the transformation that we engage in. Two questions, and probably it's difficult to answer. First, has a mass incarceration made the United States safer or not? The second way is, has a racial relationship in the United States gotten better or worse during President Obama's uh, eight years? Yeah, no, two great questions. I think one, I think there's no evidence that mass incarceration has made America safer. And in fact, as we've begun to reduce our prison population, and when we were finally able to get rid of the draconian Rockefeller drug laws here in New York State, uh, which was done in 2009, I believe, while I was in the state legislature, uh, the argument from the other side was if we were to reduce some of these punitive, harsh drug sentences, we're going to unleash mayhem on the streets of New York. And in fact, what has happened is that the crime rate has continued to go down dramatically, not up subsequent to changing the laws in New York and significantly reducing our prison population. And one of the reasons why I'm optimistic is that, you know, we've got this dynamic in America of blue states and red states, right? Uh, when the Great Recession hit, there was a lot of pressure that was put on state budgets all across America. And so, it wasn't just New York and California that did things to reduce our prison population. There were reductions in the prison population in places like Texas and Kentucky and Louisiana and Georgia and South Carolina, right? Many of these states decreased their prison population by more than 20%. And crime didn't go up, it's continued to go down. Not just in New York but in places in the Deep South that also did the same thing under Republican-led legislative bodies and governors, largely because of fiscal concerns, recognizing that public safety wouldn't be adversely impacted. And so we've got the moral high ground on this issue. And I think it is you know, the civil rights issue of the day for us to confront with all of the moral force and weight and activism uh, that it requires. Now, in terms of race relations, I think that things have certainly gotten better. Uh, but we are at a flashpoint moment, largely uh, as a result of, I think, the fact that the conflicts between the police and the community have now been put before the American people in a powerful way because of the presence of videotaped evidence that brutality does take place, that excessive force does occur. Because people in the African American community have been maintaining that this has been happening for decades. It has been happening for decades. But a lot of folks in other parts of America said that can't be possible, right? Now, in any profession, there's always going to be bad apples. And so, from my perspective, it wasn't clear how people could never understand that in a policing culture, you weren't going to have a few folks, some folks, whatever the case may be, who are going to cross the line. Problem is, when they cross the line, it's devastating consequences. And now that's all before the American people. So we're forced to confront this issue in a way that we never really have been forced to deal with it in the past. And so from a race relations perspective, that's challenging. Uh, but if you think about the fact that we are a country uh, that you know, was founded with slavery uh, at the very same moment that the nation gave birth uh, to this great republic in the United States Constitution and you know, replaced slavery with some reconstruction amendments uh, around the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th, you know, dealing with slavery, equal protection under the law, and the right to vote regardless of race, but then quickly abandon that Reconstruction period and for about 100 years had Jim Crow segregation, lynching, black codes, and things like that in the Deep South until we confronted this inconsistency in America again with the Civil Rights Movement, and then were able to emerge uh, with an African-American president 
um, the leader of the free world, I think obviously there's been tremendous progress in that regard. There's been tremendous progress in terms of the rates of African American educational attainment, home ownership, reduced poverty, despite what one of the presidential candidates may suggest that all African Americans are living in hell. I mean, um, I'm trying to refrain from dealing with that situation. Uh, but there's been tremendous progress, right, in the African American community, Latino community, and beyond. It doesn't mean that we still don't have a ways to go to confront some of the persistent problems that confront every society in the world and certainly confront America. I want us to know, um, you know, Green, um, Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, talked about the prison pipeline for children and education. And based off what you were saying about uh, prisons wanting to be uh, built to be filled, do you and, and how, like, policymakers in upstate wanted these uh, people to be going to jail so they can get money. Do you think it's a possibility that even in education in underprivileged areas that uh, administrators you know, use bribery or anything so that they could keep this uh, theme of kids getting into jail? Or yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot a very important question and observation. There's a lot to unpack there. One, um, Dwight Eisenhower warned the country. You know, he's one of our great presidents, often underrated in terms of, in my view, his presidency because he helped lead us through World War II uh, as the commander of the Allied Forces. And then he was a two-term Republican president between uh, 52 and left office in 1960. And on his way out, uh, he warned America about the rise of what he called the military industrial complex. And basically, he described the military industrial complex as this system where you would have defense contractors and other security interests um, become so powerful that they were going to drive public policy in a way that may or may not be consistent with what's good for America by creating uh, this vast um, military machine. One of the reasons why it was such an important observation is that uh, this was one of our nation's most significant warriors who helped get us through World War II, and he warned the nation about what could happen. Many of us believe that in the prison context, you've got a prison industrial complex that has been built up where public policy was being driven not by legitimate ways to promote public safety, uh, but by the economic interests that led to prison construction and maintenance. And in order to maintain those prisons, you had to have unjust laws to continue to fill the prisons. We've begun to break that down, but part of the solution is going to be uh, making sure that our education system allows people in both urban America and rural America to get the type of education necessary to be able to robustly pursue the American dream. The last point on that, uh, I know we're close to uh, time, is that for a long period, and I think Michelle Alexander may make this point uh, in her book, The New Jim Crow, which is an important book, I'd encourage everyone to read it, uh, is that often public policymakers would make a determination about uh, the number of prison slots that they would need based on third grade reading scores. And as a result, that tells you all you need to know, I think, in terms of the interconnection between a broken school system and the school to prison pipeline, which is also one of the reasons why I sit on the Education and Workforce Committee. I spend a lot of time in trying to help uh, improve our public school system in the city the state, and the United States of America. Well, I think we've been privileged to hear really <coughs> one of the best talks I've heard in a long time on, on this critical issue. So I want to thank Congressman Hakeem Jeffries for <laughs> and, uh, Thank you all for coming. And this is a conversation that we should continue to have. I'm glad it's been. Somebody else, hope we've had said she's teaching this. Alex, uh, Michelle Alex, which is really extraordinary. Another book that I'm reading right now, for those who want to 
think about uh, some of these issues going back to the Rockefeller days is a book about Attica. Uh, I forget the title of the book, Fire and something, but an extraordinary book. And uh, one of the reasons that Attica prison was so filled, <laughs> so filled with uh, people is some, are some of the things that you talked about as far as these drug policies. And I would add, I'd just throw in my own two cents, because I, I worked on this in the 90s. I was president of the college uh, in the early 2000s. One of the dumbest things, truly dumbest things, that Congress did in the, as part of this uh, 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 these uh, laws they enacted in the 90s was to take away Pell Grants from people in prison. There are statistics, absolutely undebatable statistics, that people who get an education in prison have a one-third of a recidivism rate of people who don't have it. And don't have it, don't get education. And I had a client, I represented people on death row. I had a client who was sentenced to death and he was taking a, an accounting course at a local college. And I said, well, that's optimism. But the point was that Congress took away Pell Grants, people in prison. And I once spoke to a, a senator about it, with Max Barkas, actually. I said, I said, this is an idiotic policy because the cost of recidivism is enormous. So let these people get an education. But it was all part of what the Congress was talking about, this punitive, purely punitive regime with no thought about the consequences of these policies. And to that point, thankfully, there's an, there's an effort on the way to deal with the Pell Good. Grant situation. Um, as well as just to try to reverse engineer a lot of the damage that has been done because of these draconian policies over the years. And your involvement, your investment, your interest in these issues is going to be important to continue to encourage us, who are public policy makers right now. And I gather many of you, uh, hopefully one day, will be public policy makers. Some of you will even be in the United States Congress. Just don't run against me. <laughs> <laughs>